welcome to this special CUBE conversation. I'm John Furrier here in Palo Alto, California, your host of theCUBE. We're here with Sean Knapp, who's the CEO and founder of Ascend.io, uh, heavily venture-backed, working on some really cool challenges and solving some big problems around scale, data, and creating value in a very easy way and companies are struggling to continue to evolve and refactor their business now that they've been replatformed with the cloud. You're seeing a lot of new things happening. So Sean, great to have you on and, and uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, John. So one of the things I've been uh, interesting uh, with your company, not only do you have great pedigree in terms of investors and tech, tech staff, is that you guys are going after uh, this kind of new scaling challenge, um, which is not your classic kind of talking points around, oh, the cloud scale, you know, more servers, more, more data, more volume. It's a little bit different. Can you describe what you guys mean around this new scaling challenge? Absolutely. The, the classic sense of scaling, particularly when it comes to the data industry, whether it's big data, data science, data engineering, has always focused on bits and bytes, how many servers, how big your clusters are, and you know, it, we've watched over the last five to 10 years and those kinds of scaling problems, while not entirely solved, for most companies are largely solved problems now. And the, the new challenge that is emerging is not how do you store more data or how do you process more data, but it's how do you create more data products? How do you derive more value from data? And the challenge that we see many companies today really struggling to uh, tackle is that data productivity, that data velocity challenge. And that's more of a people problem. It is a, how do you get more people able to build more products faster and safely that propel the business forward? You know, that's an interesting topic. We talk about DevOps and how DevOps is evolving. Um, and you're seeing SREs has become a standard position now in companies, site reliability engineers that Google pioneered, which is essentially the DevOps person. But now that you don't need to have a full DevOps team as you get more automation. This is a big, big part of it. Um, I want to get into that with you because you're, you're touching on some scale issues around people, there's relationships to the machines and the data. So it's an interesting conversation. But before we do that, can you just take a minute to explain uh, what you guys do? What is Ascend IO? I know you're in Palo Alto, it's where I live, um, and our office is here. What's Ascend.io all about? Absolutely, so what Ascend.io really focuses on is building the uh, software stack on top of modern day uh, big data infrastructure for data engineers, data scientists, data analysts to self-serve and create uh, active data pipelines that fuel the rest of their business. Uh, and we provide this as a service to a variety of different companies from Australia to Italy, finance to IOT, uh, startups to large enterprises, and really help elevate their teams. You know, as, as uh, Bezos said a long time ago, out of the muck of, uh, of the underlying infrastructure, we help them do the same thing uh, out of the muck of uh, classic data engineering work. That's awesome, Andy Jassy, now the CEO of Amazon, who was the CEO of I've been many times over the years, and he always has the line, undifferentiated heavy lifting. Well, I mean, data is actually differentiated and it's also heavy lifting too, but you got, you have differentiation with data, but it's super important. It's really, you gotta, but there's a lot of it now. So there's a lot of heavy lifting. This right. is where people are struggling. And I want to get your thoughts on this because you have an opinion on this around how teams are formed, how teams can scale, because we know scale's coming on the data side and there's different solutions. You got Databricks, you got Snowflake, you got Redshift, there's a zillion other opportunities for companies to deploy data tooling and platforms. What's your yeah, thoughts absolutely. on the changes in data? Well, I think in, in the data ecosystem it is, we're changing very, very quickly, uh, which makes it for a very exciting industry. Uh, and I do think that we are in this great cycle of continuing to reinvest higher and higher up the stack, if you will. Right, and in many ways, we want to keep elevating our teams, our partners, our customers, our, our, our companies out of the non-differentiated elements. Uh, and this is one of those areas where you know, we see tremendous innovation happening uh, from Amazon, from Databricks, from Snowflake, who are solving many of these underlying uh, infrastructure, uh, storage, processing, and even app some application layer challenges uh, for teams. And, and what we find oftentimes is that teams, after having uh, adopted some of these stacks and some of these solutions, 
then have to start solving the problem of how do we build faster? How do we build better? And how do we produce more on top of these incredibly valuable investments that we've made? And they're looking for uh, acceleration. Factors. They're looking for, in many ways, the uh, autopilot self-driving level of capabilities and intelligence to sit on top and help them actually uh, get the most out of these underlying systems. Yeah. And, and that's really where, where we need the big challenges. Yeah, I mean, self-driving data, but you got to have the products first. And I think you mentioned earlier a data product, um, data being products. Um, and But th there's a trend with this idea of data products, data apps. What is a data product? Um, that's a new concept. I mean, it's not, I mean, most, most people really can't get their arms around that because it's kind of new, I mean, data is data. But how, how does it become productized? And, and how do, why, is it, why is it growing so fast? Yeah, this, this is a great question. I think, you know, to, to quickly, uh, you know, talk through a lot of the evolution of the industry, oftentimes we started with the, well, let's just get the data inside of a lake. And it, it was a very bottoms up notion of, well, we can just collect it, then we'll go do something with it. The very field of dreams-esque uh, approach, right? And uh, oftentimes they didn't come in and your data just sat there and became a swamp, right? And the when we think about a, a data product oriented uh, model of building, it is less focused on the how do we just collect and store and process data. And it's much more on the business value side of how do we create a new data set? In uh, architectural models, it would be the equivalent of how do we launch a new microservice or a new feature out to a customer. But the data product is a new, uh, refined, valuable, curated, live set of data that can be used by the business, whether it's for data analysts or data scientists or all the way out to end consumers, and is very heavily oriented towards that piece because that's really where we get to deliver value for, uh, for our end users, our customers, et cetera. Yeah, and getting that data fast is key. Again, I love this idea of data becoming programmable or kind of a data ops kind of vibe where you're seeing data products that it, that can be nurtured and also scaled up too with people. Uh, as, as this continues, the next kind of logical question I have for you is, okay, you, I, I get the data products. Now I have teams of people, how do I deploy them? How do the teams change? Because now you have low code and no code capabilities and you have some front end tools that make it easy to, to, to create new, new apps and, and and um, products and where data can feed in. So someone discovers a cool new value metric in a company, um, they can say here, boss is a new new metric that we've identified that drives our business. Now they yep. got to productize that in the app. They use low code, no code. Where do you guys see this going? Because you can almost see a whole nother persona of a developer emerging or engineering yeah. team emerging. Absolutely, and, and you know, it, it's, I think this is one of the challenges is, you know, when we look at the data ecosystem, uh, we even ran a, a survey a couple of months ago across a, a hundreds of, of different developers asking data scientists, data engineers, data analysts about the overall productivity of their teams. And what we found was 96% of teams are at or over capacity, meaning only 4% of teams even have the capacity to start to invest in better tools or better skill sets. And, and, and most are really under the gun. And what that means is teams and companies are looking for more people with different skill sets, uh, how, and frankly, how they get more leverage out of the folks where they have, so they spend less time maintaining more than building. And so what ends up starting to happen is this introduction of no code and no code solutions to help broaden the pool of people who can contribute to this. Uh, and what we find oftentimes is there's a, a bit of a, a standoff happening between uh, engineering teams and analyst teams and data science teams, teams where some people want low code, some people want no code, some people just want super high code all day, all, all the time. And what we're finding is, and even actually as part of one of the surveys that, that we ran, uh, most users, a uh, very small percentage, less than 10% of users actually were amenable to no code solutions, but more than 70% were amenable to solutions that leaned towards lower no code, but allowed them to still program in a language of their choice, and gave them more leverage. And so what we see end up happening is really this new era of what we describe as flex code, where it doesn't have to be just low code or just no code. 
but teams can actually plug in at different layers of the stack and different abstraction layers and contribute side by side with each other all towards the, the creation of this data product uh, with a pluggable model of FlexCode. So let's unpack FlexCode for a second if you don't mind. To sure. first define what you mean by FlexCode and then talk about the implications to, to the teams because it sounds like it's, a, it's integrated but yet decoupled at layers. So can you take me through what it is and then let's unpack it a little bit. Absolutely, it, you know, FlexCode is really a methodology that of course companies like ours will, will go and productize, but it is a, the belief structure that you should be able to peel back layers and contribute to an architecture, in this case, a, a data architecture, whether it's through building in a no code interface or by writing some low code say in SQL or down and actually running uh, lower level systems and languages. And it's it, it's become so critical and key in the data ecosystem as what's classically happened has been the, well, if we need to go deeper into the stack, if we need to customize more of how we run this one particular data job, you end up then throwing away most of the benefits uh, and the adoption of any of these other code and tools ends up shutting off a lot of the, the rest of the company from contributing and you then have to be, for example, a, a really advanced Scala developer who understands how to extend Docker runtime environments okay. uh, to contribute. And, and the reality is you probably want a few of those, those folks on your team and you do want them contributing, but you still want the data analysts and the data scientists and the software engineers able to contribute at higher levels of the stack all building that solution together. So, so I, it becomes this hybrid architecture. Yeah, no, I, I love, I mean, this is, this is really good exploration here because so what you're saying is it's not that low code and no code is inadequate. It's just that the evolution of, of the market is such that as people start writing more code, things kind of break downstream. You got to pull the expert in to kind of fix the plumbing and lower levels of the stack, so to speak, the more higher end systems oriented kind of components. So that's just an evolution of the market. So you're saying flex code is the next level of innovation around productizing that in an architecture so you don't waste someone's time to get yanked in to solve a problem just to fix something that's working or broke at this point. So if it works, it breaks. Exactly. Right? So you know, it's working that people are coding with no code and low code. It just breaks something else downstream. You're fixing that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's the um, the idea being here is, you know, it's one of these old adages of uh, when you're selling out to customers, we see this and I remember this uh, head of engineering one time uh, told me, look, you may make 95% of my team's uh, job easier, but if you make the last 5% impossible, it, it, it's a non-starter. And so a lot of this comes down to the, how do we make that 95% uh, of a team's job far easier? But when you really have to go do that one ultra advanced customized thing, how do we make sure you still get all that benefit, but you know, oftentimes through a low code or a no code interface, but you can still go back down and really tune and optimize that one piece. Yeah, and that's really kind of, I mean, this is really an architectural decision because that's the classic, you don't want to foreclose the future options, right? So as a developer, exactly. you need to think of making, this is really where you have to make an architecture decision. That's really requires you guys to, you know, lean into that architectural team. How do you guys do that? What those conversations look like? Is it work with Ascend and we got you covered or, you know, how does, how does those conversations go? Because if someone's slinging low code, no code, they might not even know that they're foreclosing that 5%. Yeah, oftentimes the, you know, for them, they're uh, they're the ones that are given the hardest, grittiest, gnarliest problems to, to solve for um, and may not uh, have, even have the visibility that there's a team of 30, you know, analysts who can go write incredible data pipelines if they are still afforded a, a low code or no code interface on top. And so, you know, for us, we really partner uh, heavily with our customers and our users. Uh, we do a ton of joint architecture design decisions, not just for their products, but we actually bring them in uh, to all of our uh, architecture and design and road mapping sessions as well. Uh, and we do a lot of collaborative building. Uh, very much how we uh, treat uh, the developer community uh, around the company uh, itself. So we spend a lot of time on so that. You're, you're, a part, you're, you're a partner strategy. You're building the bridge to the future with the customer. Yeah, absolutely. We uh, we work, in, in fact, almost all of our communications with our customers happen in shared Slack channels. We are treated like extensions of our customer's team and, and we treat them as 
our internal customers as yeah. well. And that's the way. And that's the way it should be. You're doing some great work. This is really cutting edge and really setting the table for you know a decade of innovation with the customer if you get it right. Uh, if they get if they get it right. Uh, so I got to ask you with this um, architecture. You got to be factoring in automation because orchestration, automation, these are the principles of DevOps that kind of go on the next level. I love this, love this conversation, DevOps 2.0, 4.0, whatever you want to call it. It's the next level DevOps. It's data automation. Yeah. You're taking it to a whole nother level within your sphere. Talk about Absolutely. automation and how that factors in. Obviously there's benefits to automation, autonomous data pipelining would be cool, no coding. I can see maintenance is an issue. Um, how do you offload developers so that it's not only an easy button, but it's a maintenance easy maintenance button? Yeah, absolutely. The you know what we find in the evolution of most technical domains is this shift happens at some point, usually towards or from an imperative developer model to a declarative de developer model. For example, we see this uh, in databases with the introduction uh, of SQL. We see it in infrastructure definition with uh, tools like uh, Terraform uh, and now Kubernetes. And what we do from an automation perspective uh, for, uh, for data pipelines is very similar to what Kubernetes does for containers. We do for data pipelines. We introduce a declarative model and put in this incredible intelligence that tracks everything around how data moves uh, for us, metadata alone is a big data problem uh, because we track so much information and all that goes into this central brain that is dynamically adapting to code and data for our, our users and dynamically generating work. And so for us, when we look at the, the biggest potential to automate is to help alleviate maintenance and optimization burdens for users so they get to spend more time building and less time maintaining. And that really goes into the, how do you have this central brain that it tracks everything that builds this really deep understanding of how data moves through an organization. Yeah, that's an awesome vision. I got to ask, my, my, my brain's firing off. I'm like, okay, so what about runtime assembly? As you orchestrate data in real time, you have to kind of pull the assembly to all uh, and link and load all this data together. Um, I can only imagine how hard that is, right? So can you share your vision? Because you, know, you mentioned Docker containers, the benefits of containers is, you know, they can manage state and stateless data. So as you get into this notion of state and stateless uh, data, how do you assemble it all in real time? How does that work? How does that brain figure it out? What's the <laughs> secret sauce? Yeah, that's a really great question. Uh, you know, for us, and this is one of the, the most exciting parts for uh, our customers and our, our users is, uh, we help with this paradigm shift where the classic model has been the, you're writing code, you compile it, you ship it, you push it out. Uh, and then, you know, you like, you cross your fingers, you're like, gosh, I really hope that that works. Um, and it's a very slow iteration cycle. And one of the things that we've been able to do because of this intelligence layer is actually help hybridize that for users. You still have pipelines and they still run and they're still optimizing, but we make it an interactive experience at the same time, uh, very similar to how uh, notebooks uh, for data science help make that such an interactive experience. We make the, the process of building data pipelines and doing data engineering work iterative and interactive. So you're getting instantaneous feedback and evolving very quickly. So the, the things that used to take weeks or months due to slow iteration cycles it really now can be done in hours or days uh, because of, you get such fast feedback loops as you build. Well, we definitely need your product. We have so much data on the media side and all these events. And they're all like little data. It's like little data, but it's big data. It's a lot of little data that makes it a big data problem. And I do feel like I'm jumping out of the airplane with the parachute and will it open? You know, when we work, it's like, <laughs> you just, we don't, you know, we don't know, right? So a lot of the fear is, you know, splat. We don't want to, you know, crater and build data products that are, you know, praying, right? This is, this is really kind of what everyone's doing right now. It's kind of state of the industry. How do you guys make it easy? That's the question, right? Because you, you brought up the human aspect, which I love the human scale. How do you scale teams? Nobody wants another project if they are already burnt out with COVID and they don't have enough resources. You know, it's almost like there's a, there's a little bit of psychology going on in the human mind now saying well, enough or burnout or, you know, the relationship to humans um, training data. Data has now got this human interaction. All of it is, is around, you know, ease of use, future of work and simplicity and self-service. 
What's your thoughts yep. on those? Oh, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I think the uh, we need to continue to be pushing those boundaries around self-service and around developer uh, and frankly, just outright data productivity. You know, and, and for us, I, I think it's become a, a really fascinating uh, time in the industry as, uh, you know, I would say in 2019, 2020, much of the industry had, and users and builders in the industry had just embraced the fact that, frankly, the building data pipeline sucked. Uh, and it was a badge of honor because uh, it was such a hard and painful thing. Yet what we're finding is now, as the industry is, is evolving, is an expectation that it should be easier. Uh, and people are challenging that conventional wisdom and expecting uh, building data pipelines to be much easier. And that's really where you know, we come in is both with a flex code model and with high levels of automation to keep people squarely focused on rapid building uh, versus maintaining and, and tinkering too deep in the stack. You know, I really think you're onto something with the one, the scaling challenge of people and teams, huge issue. To match that at the pace of you know, cloud and data scale is a huge, huge focus. And I'm glad you're focusing on that. So that's a human issue. And then on um, the data architecture. I mean, we saw with Hadoop how, how, how to do a failed project. You require the customer to create all this you know, undifferentiated support and heavy lifting and, and la time lag just to get to value, right? There's no value, right? So, in, enter yeah. cloud. So, so this is, a, you're on the right track. How do you talk to customers? Take a minute to, to share with the folks who are watching, or if it's a customer or an enterprise or a potential customer, what's in it for them? Why ascend? Why should they work with you? How do they engage with you guys? What's in it for them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, What's in it for customers is time to value, truncated dramatically. Uh, you get projects live and you get them faster, far faster than ever thought possible. Uh, you know, the way that we engage with our customers uh, is we help partner them with them. We launch them uh, on the uh, on the application. They can buy us from the marketplace. Uh, we will actually help even architect their first project with them uh, and ensure that they have full-fledged live data uh, product data products live uh, within the first four weeks. Uh, and that really, I think, becomes the the most key thing. It, it, frankly, is it doesn't, features and functions and so on really don't matter. Ultimately, at the end of the day, what really matters is can you get your data products live? Can you deliver business value? And are your is your team happy as they get to go build? Do they do they smile more throughout the day because they're enjoying that, that developer uh, experience? So you're providing the services to get them going. It's the old yep. classic expression, teaching them how to fish, and then they can fish on their own. Is that right? Yep, absolutely. And then doing whatever next next gen thing. <laughs> yeah, and then then the we are we are excited uh, to watch quarter after quarter, uh, year after year, our customers build more and more data products, uh, and their teams are growing faster than most of the, the other teams in their companies because they're delivering so much value, and that's what's so exciting. You know, uh, the, for them, the, is the cliche, successful. every company is a, is a data company. I know that's kind of cliche, but it's true, right? Everyone has to have yeah. a core DNA, but they don't have, they shouldn't have to hire hardcore data engineering. They have a data team for sure, but that team has to create a service model for practitioners inside the company. Well, hard they agree. Sean, great, great conversation. Um, great to unpack uh, the flex code. I love that approach take it to the next level, take it low code to the next level with data, great stuff, and Ascend.io, Palo Alto based uh, company. Congratulations on, on your success. Thank you so much, John. Okay, this is theCUBE Conversation here in Palo Alto. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. Thanks for watching.